I'm not going to speak very much about the music business, even though that's my business. Um, when, when I saw the question about increasing the life of content, I had to come up with a different answer because I knew if I just answered at the end, um, it would seem somehow out of context. And I was thinking this morning, it's like, um, what's that TV show with the, there's like these geeky scientists, uh, Big Bang. Big Bang Theory, and you know that intro to the, to the show where they kind of take you from the primordial soup and really fast in 30 seconds all the way through to the first episode? That's kind of what I'm going to do today. And I'm going to start with uh, Philip Lieberman, who is a doctor of linguistics. And what he wanted to, to study was the origins of speech, and he's been studying his whole career. And in 2007, he actually published a piece of work, The Evolution of Human Speech. And what he did was he would get skulls uh, from humans from million years all the way up to present and try and reconstruct their palate, where the tongue would sit, how their teeth would be, all this to understand when the first humans would speak. And a lot of it had to do with the position of the larynx and the throat. And he could reconstruct all this using skulls. And so humans, as, as in Homo sapiens, have been on the planet for about 200,000 years. And it turns out we've only been able to have complex speech for about the last 50,000 years. So 50,000 years ago, we get complex speech. All of these things, the positioning of the tongue and the larynx and the mouth are able to create this. And nobody else was able to do this. I mean, Neanderthals lived at the same time and they couldn't produce complex speech. So why is this so important? Because what it allowed us to do was to take complex thoughts from my brain and put it into your brain. Before that, we could give some of our thoughts and ideas to the next person, but we couldn't really express complex thought until we had speech. And so what was the result of this? The first technology explosion. This is 50,000 years ago. It's called the Upper Paleolithic. And it was a period in time marked by this creation of a vast number of tools that never existed before. It's not like on other archaeological digs, they didn't find an arrowhead. They just didn't see it change for very long periods of time, thousands, tens of thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, during this period, there's an explosion of all of this technology. And that led to the next technology explosion, which also happened at the same time, and it was a cultural explosion. And with all this technology, they were able to create the first jewelry. So this is a saber-toothed tiger tooth that they were able to put a hole through and create a necklace. The first musical instrument was created during this period. And this is a, the antler of a deer with some holes drilled in it so it could produce sound. You, you begin to see the first sculptures and this is a woolly mammoth tusk. It's actually four pieces that were put together 35,000 years ago to create that figure. And all of a sudden, things like cave paintings turned into pieces of art. They weren't just a picture. They were artwork. And I think there's this common need that once we have these ideas, these thoughts, we want to be able to preserve them, and we want to be able to share them. So we started to create boxes to put these in, places where we could house our ideas. And once we began to save our ideas, we created content. Because having a conversation is one thing, saving that conversation becomes a piece of content that now can go on the web. And this journey continues on, um, and we then begin to develop the written language, which comes from speech. And even 3,000 years ago, you start to see, no, actually 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years before the birth of Christ in Mesopotamia, 
which is now Iraq, you begin to see the first library where its collections of content are starting to be put together so that we can save them. And the, the boxes that we store that content in go from books to albums to music videos. I think we, I don't need to show this clip again, do I? For those of you that were in the earlier session. Um, so there's nothing new about saving content. And in, in fact, when you think about the longevity of content, there's nothing new about it. So what problem are we really trying to solve? I mean, if you think about it, I can go back and look at the, the Psy video if I want. I can go back and read Shakespeare if I want. I can go back as far as the very first bits of content that were saved. So I think we have to ask ourselves a different question rather than how do we extend the life of content? So In 1971, there was an economist by the name of Herbert Simon, uh, I mean, Herbert Alexander Simon. And what he said was, in a world that's information rich, in an information rich world, it's going to create the dearth of something, a scarcity of whatever it is that information consumes. So there's two, two key elements in there. 1971, so a couple of decades before the World Wide Web, he had already envisioned this world of a mass amount of information coming at us. Facebook status updates, YouTube clips, Twitter feeds, all of this information. And it was going to create a dearth of something, a scarcity. All this information was going to make something else scarce. That's the first part. The other is, it's that the information that is being created is actually consuming something. We're not the ones consuming information. Information is consuming us. It's consuming our time and our attention. And he's the one that coined the phrase, the attention economy. And that's the world we live in. So it's not about how do I extend the life of my content. We're now in a competition with everybody's content. This is a world where there can't be multiple winners. Because if I'm going to listen to your album, I can't also listen to somebody else's. I can't read two books at the same time or watch two television shows simultaneously. And now we've entered a world where it's not just professionals creating content. Everybody on Facebook is. That's my wife. When I showed her that I was going to put this up here, she was a little embarrassed because she's one of those people that likes taking uh, photos of the food she makes. And she hand formed these veggie burgers. But the reason she was embarrassed was not this. It was only because it got a few likes. Normally, she likes to get hundreds of likes for her food photos. And she's like, no, don't show that one. Pick a different one. Um, so now we're competing with user-generated content for our time. And as people are now accessing all of this information, essentially the entire recorded information of the world is at people's fingertips and they're accessing it on their mobile phones. Um, it means that we need to change something. And it's not change our marketing or promotion strategy. It's not, if you're going to consume it on your mobile phone, how are we going to market it better to you? It's really about creating content differently. We need to get off the notion that books are sacred. I mean, remember, this is just, I have a thought in my brain, I wanted to get it into your brain. The most effective way, even in the last century, might have been to write a book. But is it the most effective way today? So, this has changed the type of content so that now we're making what I call micro-content. 
And if you, again, if you were in the session before, you saw all those little video clips that our people are making, all this micro content. It's what, uh, there's a book by a, a guy named Douglas Rushkoff called Present Shock. And the way he envisions it is instead of telling a story in a linear way, beginning, middle, and end, the world we live in now with this wash of information is more like a jigsaw puzzle. You can put the pieces down in any order, and over time, as you put the pieces down, you'll start to see the picture and understand it. And this is how we interact with media now. When I start following somebody, I don't have to go back to their very first post. I just start in the middle and pick up wherever I am. I can go backwards, look forward. And this is how we're consuming information now. And what happens when people start consuming information this way? It becomes very addictive. You know, little bits of information, one after another, is, is not so different than getting addicted to cigarettes. Um, I don't know if any of you guys know a heroin addict. All right, you can tell them in the music industry, because when you talk to heroin addicts, um, they often talk about how easy it was to kick the habit of heroin compared to quitting smoking, which is impossible. Why? Because all day long, little tiny doses of the drug are entering your system. And this is much like the world we live in today. And how do we know that? Because we look at what happens when we take it away. And people go through withdrawal. Have you ever walked into a room with a group of friends and the first thing you do is you, your phone's out of battery and you walk in, you're like, anyone got a, a charger? And they go, oh, I got an iPhone 4. No, it's an iPhone 5. Anyone got an iPhone? And you, you're, you're running around, you finally get your device plugged in, you check, everything's okay with the world. Oh, hey everyone, how's it going? This is the world we live in. And so what you want to do is actually make people addicted to your content. This is the good news about content. If you have great ideas and you want to put those ideas in people's heads, don't save them up for one book that you're going to put out every five years. Feed them little bits of content regularly and get them addicted to your thoughts. So in the past, the way we looked at it was we would create the content first and then build an audience. So in the music business, an artist would get signed, they'd go away, they'd write an album, they'd then go record the album, then they'd spend three to six months of setting up a marketing plan around it, and then tell everyone, we have a new album. Well, it doesn't work that any way anymore. Now it starts with the audience first. First, we build an audience. We don't, it, this isn't the chicken and egg. I know which comes first, the audience, not the content. Because once I have an audience, I can, I can speak to them differently. So now we look at the world as um, an ARPU world. Do you know ARPU? Average revenue per user. So instead of placing the value in the content, the value is now in the end user. And we use the content to monetize the end user. Does that make sense? Because in a world where content is ubiquitous, when the entire history of music, for instance, is in Spotify for free, then we have to think differently about how we make our money. And the money is now based in the user. And in that world of ubiquitous content, what is it they value? Two things. They value experiential, you know, if you're in the music business, it's creating a package where people can go meet the band backstage. That's special stuff. People pay a lot for that. Or limited edition or, or rare uh, content, like we'll press up 500 seven-inch records and sign each one. Because when everything's available in the music, what I want is the rare thing. That's what people value today. So, very quickly, now that we've gone from ideas and putting them in boxes, which create the content, 
and technology drives what content we create, we need to change those boxes that we put things in and stop thinking about the ways we've been doing it all these years because people want to consume things differently. So it's a bit like that phrase, if a, if, a, if, a, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there, does it make a sound? So now I think of it in the content world is, if, if you've created a piece of content and you haven't built an audience, will anyone be able to consume it? Thank you very much. <laughs>